Well, good evening, Mount Zion Baptist Church. Pastor Kevin here, and we're so excited that you've joined us for yet another session in this exciting series, Rekindling the Fires of Faith. And we're so thankful uh, for Dr. Edwin Jenkins and his willingness to study the Word of God and to present it so clearly and so plainly each week. And you've tuned in, and we're so glad. I hope you have your Bible, something to write with. This, these are the things that he always reminds us of before we actually dive into the study. I hope you remember what we're going to be doing every day at 6 o'clock. Now, maybe not everybody has started, and I have not even gotten into the rhythm of doing this yet, but we're all going to do this today. Set your alarm on your smartphone at 6 p.m. every night. Here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be gathering together in a spirit of unity, praying for our families, praying for our church, praying for our community, and praying for our country. Those four areas are so important. We know that the evil one will attack the family. And as we talk about spiritual warfare every single Sunday, make no mistake about it. Satan will come after your marriage. He'll come after your children. And so we need to be steadfast in praying for our spouse, for our children. The most important thing that you could do in discipling them is to pray for them. Every single day, we need to be doing that. And then for our church as well. Satan would love nothing more than to destroy the unity of the, fa of the fabric of our church. And so we want to be so faithful to pray for one another. Let's lift up our pastoral staff, our deacon body, our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, and for our community. This is the place where God has chosen to put us. We live in this town. We live in Madison. We live in Huntsville. Some of you live in Athens or other places. But this is where God has chosen to put us. And he, in his sovereignty, has allowed us to live around whatever neighbors we live around and to go to work with whatever people we work with and to see certain people at the store. These are the people that God wants us to be salt and light amongst. And so let's pray for our community. Let's pray for our local leaders. And let's pray for our country. In less than 30 days, we'll have probably one of the most important election cycles in our lifetime. We need to be praying for our president. We need to be praying that the outcome of this election would please Almighty God. And our country doesn't deserve it, but we are praying for the favor of God on this great land, that God would heal our land and that he would bring not only the church but this world toward him. And so we can pray for our country as well, those four areas. And all of these prayers, all of this is consistent with what God's Word tells us to do. 1 Timothy chapter 2, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Are you giving thanks for people in your life in these four areas? Are you praying for them? Are you interceding? For them, It's one thing to gripe, moan, complain, fuss, uh, act out in anger, but it's another thing to pray. We need to be praying for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good. Sometimes we're not quite sure what's good in this life, but this is good. Prayer is always good. This is good. And we know it pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so if people are going to come to a knowledge of the truth and find salvation through Jesus Christ, it will be in part because God's people have been pray praying. Verse 5, For there is one God and mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to lift up holy hands without anger or disputing. And this, of course, would apply to our sisters in Christ as well. But, but I think God knows how tempting it is for men in general to act out in anger and to turn red in the face. And so he says, listen, don't do that. Instead, lift up your holy hands. These are holy hands that God has given us. Mm -hmm. And lift them up, not, not with tight fists and anger, but lift them up in a spirit of prayer. 
And you know what? You could do that right now. I don't know who's around you, but guess what? Doesn't matter. Lift up those holy, holy hands right now. And let's just enter into a spirit of prayer, asking God's blessing on Brother Edwin as he comes to preach us to us today. God, we thank you. We lift up our holy hands, and not in whining, fussing, complaining, but in a spirit of faith. Uh, And we pray for our president, we pray for the Congress, we pray, God, for the Supreme Court, and we pray not only for those in in positions and and high in authority, but we pray for our family, we pray for our church, we pray for our community, and for everybody that you've allowed us to live alongside. We, We ask God that you would help us to be salt and light so that others can come to know you as Savior and Lord. We lift up this time and we pray your special blessing and anointing on Brother Edwin as he preaches and teaches to us this important message on marriage and rekindling our hearts toward our spouses and toward you. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen and amen. Brother Edwin, would you please come at this time? Thank you, Pastor, and it is so good to be back with you again this evening or whenever you are viewing this particular lesson. I am so grateful for these opportunities as I've shared with you virtually every week as we come together because every opportunity we have to come together is one of those times when we believe God speaks to us in a very special way. Now, we may be separated by, by geography. We may be separated in different places right now, but yet we are coming together. Our hearts are together, and God does something very special as we study God's Word together because, you see, the Holy Spirit within us and the Holy Spirit who inspired this word to be written is also one who wants to work among us during this time and that's exciting to me i appreciate our pastor pointing us in the directions that we are going as a church right now god is blessing mount zion baptist church it is such an honor for me to be a part of this fellowship with each of you it is an exciting thing to me I get excited when I think about our church and when I think about you, each one of you who join us uh, from time to time in studies and for the excitement that is true when we come together, Sunday is just an adventure for us. And tonight is an adventure for us because tonight we're looking at marriage, we're looking at the second installment in regard to the passage. Now, go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Malachi. Pastor's already indicated to you to get your notebook out. Do you have your notebook? I have my notebook. I have my pencils too. Brought my pencils with me. I've got my red pen and my blue pen and I have my pencil. Uh, I write a lot of times with a pencil because I make mistakes and I have to Uh, correct them, and they're easier to correct. Have you noticed that with a pencil than with a pen? At any rate, that's just an aside, and I thought I would just indicate that to you today. Uh, I am looking at my Bible here at Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. Now, you'll remember that last week we began in verse 10, and we went through verse 16. Let me get us up to that point. Today we're on session number six, if you're counting, and today we're on part two of this, uh, this important analyzation of marriage. We're looking at what God is saying. He's telling the children of Israel, you've broken faith with me. And he's saying, you need to get this thing right. You need to get this thing straightened out. And so some of us may need to do the very same thing. Notice what the title is. Commit or recommit to your marriage covenant. Now, that's a unique word there. Marriage covenant. Because so often we don't think of marriage as a covenant. Now, we may know the the word, but we may not know the concept at all. In fact, so often I think that we say marriage covenant, but we really think of marriage contract. And so we're going to look at the contrast of those things today in in part two of Malachi 2, 10 through 16. Uh, This is the first time I've ever addressed this topic um, myself 
on, in this particular way. Uh, I've taught through the book of Malachi before. I'm teaching through again. But I needed a brand new approach in terms of the way I would look at covenant marriage. And I've taught about covenant marriage before. But this is brand new. It's new to me and, and probably new to you too. New to you coming from me. Anyway, let's pray and pray that God will be in charge. Now, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the time we've had in prayer already. Thank you as pastor has so well led us. And now, Lord, I pray, I pray that your Holy Spirit, please, mm -hmm. would be in charge of my thinking, of my speaking, and of the thinking and the responsiveness of every person who has tuned in. Lord, we believe that you do unique things when we yield ourselves to you. So, Lord, we are yielded to you. Let Jesus be clearly seen. Let us not be an obstacle, but let us be an instrument that you might see fit to use today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Marriage as a covenant. What is the difference in contracts and covenants? The difference in contrast... Uh, contracts and covenants. Uh, I, I've gotten some really great help from Gary Chapman in his book Covenant Marriage that was published in 2003 by Broadman Holman and that along with other resources have been extremely helpful to me with that as being the the basis of, of this particular lesson. Why is such a distinction important for Christians today, and it is extremely important for us today. Contract. A contract is basically an agreement between two or more persons indicated that one will do something if the other or others will do something. We live in a contract-oriented society. And I'm sure that you realize that already because many of you, uh, probably most, in fact, the, the large majority of you are very familiar with contracts. You've signed a number of contracts in your life where one or more persons pledge to do something and the other persons also say, if you do that, we'll do this. Now, covenant. A covenant is also an agreement between two or more persons, yet with a significantly different nature and foundation. Now, I want you to hang on to that concept there. A different nature, a different foundation when we're dealing with a covenant. Now, we learn about covenants from God's Word. I um, today felt like, and I put this in my notes uh, so I could share it with you and not forget to share it with you, and that is we need to have on our roller skates today. We really do. We're going to go through a lot of Scripture today. And so I thought about just simply showing you if I had roller skates and could put them on my fingers because I have 14 grandchildren. I get used to doing little things that I can teach them with. And, and, and I want you to put the roller skates on your fingers. Actually, you need more than, than two fingers, though. You probably need a roller derby. You need to have a lot of fingers ready because we're going to be looking at a great amount of scripture um, as we go through this today. Now, let me say to you, contracts are very, very important. And so I don't want to minimize that in any way. But covenants are also important. Now, contracts, some of them are legally binded, some, binding. Some of those are morally binding. Some of those are formal and some of those are informal. But basically, when we're talking about a contract, and I think you're getting it in review here of contract, I will do this if you will do that. I will do something, and you will do something, and we commit ourselves, even sometimes with a signature or by word of mouth, we commit to that other person that we will do what we will do if they will do what they will do. Now, those if words are very, very important as we look at this. Now, you've got your Bible there. Let's look together. 
back at our basic passage of Scripture here in Malachi. Look at Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2, and we're looking there, verses 10 through 16. Now, you remember last time I gave a summation internally while we were going through our study that the entire paragraph, verses 10 through 16, could be summarized with the words, breaking faith. And that's what the children of Israel had done. They had broken faith with God. They had broken faith. Now, now he deals with a lot of life in the book of Malachi. But in particular, in regard to marriage, if you look at verse 10 again, notice what the word says there. About the third sentence, we'll pick up on that question. Why do we profane the covenant of our ancestors by being unfaithful to one another? Now, did you hear that? Why do we profane the covenant of of our ancestors by being unfaithful to one another. And you'll remember from last time, being unfaithful is also translatable. And it was in an earlier version of the New International Version of the Bible, it was translated as breaking faith. Why have you broken faith with one another? Why have you broken faith? And he's talking in particular there about spouses. He's talking about husbands and wives. And then you'll recall that we, we skipped down and looked at some additional verses. And another one of those was verse 14. And uh, here again about the third sentence there, or the second sentence there, I should say, you have been unfaithful, and he's saying there, You've been unfaithful to the wife of your youth. Though she is your partner, the wife, here we go, of your marriage covenant. The wife of your marriage covenant. You have broken faith with her. Then we skip on down to verse 15. And there in verse 15 we saw the, the culmination or the, the, the final summary of that as uh, the writer, Malachi, is telling us, so be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. Do not break faith with her. And then the, the last part of what we looked at in the paragraph in verse 16 of Malachi 10, he says this, so be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. I've got that underlined in my Bible, those words, because they mean breaking faith. Don't break faith. Don't break faith with the covenant that you have made. Now, he doesn't use the contractual word there. It's, it's not so much a contract, an if-then thing, as it is a covenant. Now, let me mention to you some things about contracts. Here are the contracts. They're often made for a limited period of time. Oftentimes, a, a contract will be made. In fact, even in marriage, sometimes we make contracts. There are those things that we assume about one another that we can do that. Uh, a wife might come in and say to her husband, Honey, uh, I would like for you to keep the kids tonight so I can go shopping. Now, there are several things going on there. She wants him to keep the kids, and he's already alerted because he heard that word shopping. Now, that's usually very costly. We'll not get into that. That's not the point. But the fact is, she comes in, she says, I want you to do that. She says, would you keep the kids tonight so I can go shopping? If you will, then tomorrow night, I will keep the kids so that you can go and whatever it may be. Or I will keep the kids on Saturday so that you can play golf, go fishing, whatever it may be. Did you catch the wording there? Honey, I need for you to keep the kids tonight so I can go and do something I've really been wanting to do. If you will keep them tonight, then... I will keep them on Saturday so you can do something you want to do. Now, that would be for a, a limited period of time, wouldn't it? Now, that's just an illustration, and I don't want to get into too much detail there. Second thing, they usually deal with specific actions. 
If you will do this, then I will do that. How many of you have service contracts on some of the things that you have? Some of you uh, probably have a, a, a phone right now. And most people do have their own personal phones right now. Did you get a service contract on that phone? Or if you're watching this on TV, did you get a service contract? Now, some of you are not going to hear another thing that I say because you're saying, oh, no, I may have let that thing lapse. Don't think about that right now. Work on that later. Just put down service contract. There are contracts that we make so that if something goes wrong, that it will be worked out. So, so that usually deals with specific actions. You may have contracts on your appliances and all sorts of things like that. Some of you bought purchased automobiles, and because of that, you may have a contract on that, an if-then type thing, and that's what we come to. Usually, they involve that if-then language. If you do this, then I will do that. If you're going to pay me this as the man, the salesman, then I will make sure that I take care of whatever it may be. Now, that's a contractual arrangement. Look at number four generally motivated by the desires of those involved. Think with me for a moment. A realtor is in business to sell whatever, whatever properties, whatever houses. If it's a, a house realtor, they're in business to sell houses. Now, someone's moving to a community, and we've had so many people moving into the Huntsville community. This is a, a constant thing, and I'm living in a, a burgeoning, growing community there at Midtown here in Huntsville, and it seems like all the time they're building another house, building another house, building another house. Well, there are realtors who sell those houses. There are people who sell those houses. Now, generally motivated, motivated by the desires of those involved. The realtor is making his or her living by selling the house, and the person moving to the community wants to buy the house. So they set up a contractual agreement. Now, as long as the house payments are made, then that person is purchasing that house. Or if they give the whole amount, then they have purchased the house. There's an if-then mentality in that. I do this, you do that. You give me a good house, I give you the money that I have earned for that house. And then, number five, sometimes involve unspoken and or implied agreements. And, and sometimes we say, well, we never discussed this, but I assumed you would do that. We never really got into the detail of this. So contracts are not always those things that are written out and we have to sign. Sometimes it's by assumption. Sometimes it's, it's just a way of us dealing with life itself. So those are some of the things about contracts. Now, our society and culture is accustomed to contracts. That's why I can very quickly go through the idea of contracts because you understand exactly what we're talking about. Unfortunately, as the case may be, I'm afraid that many times we've approached marriage as a contract instead of a covenant. And what I want to urge you to do even if you've not considered it before, I want you to think about making a covenant of your marriage, not just a contract, not just something that could be dissolved, but something that is going to carry you to the end of your days, something that is a covenant that you've made. You say, now, I don't know exactly what you mean. There are five basic characteristics of covenants. And I want to share with you that sometimes a covenant looks something like a contract, but it is so much more. It is so much deeper. There is so much more intentionality about that than there is with a contract. And there's so much more of respect and so many more issues. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Five basic characteristics. Let's look at them. They're initiated for the benefit of the other person. Do you know that basically you learn about covenants from Almighty God? God made covenants with man, and He makes covenants with man. 
In fact, you need to be aware that if you're a Christian, God's made a covenant with you. He made the covenant, and then to get the benefits of that covenant, you received that covenant that he had made into your life. So now you have become a recipient of the benefits of the covenant. Now that'll be more clear as we go along. What I want you to see is, is, is the fact that God made covenants. Now, I think about that first covenant that we read of that God made. God made a covenant with Noah. Do you remember Noah? He was a, he was a sailor, wasn't he? And, and, and Noah was a very special guy. God made a covenant with Noah. If you go to Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, as I said, you need to be ready to go with us now. Genesis chapter 6, and if you want to look at the index and find out where all these books are, then, then simply do so. You know that's the first book in the Bible. Genesis chapter 6, God has been working with Noah. And after the great flood, and I'm not going to go into all the details of the flood and all the building and so forth that Noah did, but I want you to skip to verse 18. Genesis 6, verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And then he gives them additional words there, additional responsibilities. We'll not go into all that. I want you to know that our God is a covenant-making God. And the first one of those covenants that we see actually spoken of as a covenant is there in Genesis 6. Now, God had already made a covenant. Uh, before that. But this is acknowledged as the first of the covenants that God had made. He made a covenant regarding salvation back in chapter 3, verse 15, when he, he already was making a way, a plan of redemption and salvation. We'll not get into all of that. That'll be a little little more involved than we're going to go at this time. But God made a covenant with Noah. And, and later on, he ratifies that covenant. His covenant with Noah, if you go on over to chapter 9, if you go over to chapter 9, and we're going to see this again in, in, in a little while, I think. But Genesis chapter 9, verse 12, and God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. Are you getting the covenant terminology there that God uses? He says, I have set my rainbow in the clouds. This is after the flood. After the flood. Before the flood, he said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I make a covenant with you. I establish my covenant with you. Now, after the flood, he is actually saying right here, here's my covenant. And he says in verse 13, this is Genesis 9, verse 13, I've set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Now, do you realize that that covenant that God made there at that time is still operative. But the benefits of that covenant were received by Noah even in advance because he went into the ark. Now, now I'm just trying to share with you a few things as we go along in that regard. Now, God made a covenant not only with Noah, but also with Abraham. And, and I want you to go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Got your roller skates on. And I want you to look at Genesis chapter 12. Here's where he makes a covenant with Abraham to bless all nations of the earth through him and through his family. Let me show you what it says here. The call of Abraham is in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. That's an amazing thought. God had called him. God had called him, and God was going to use him. God has a plan. He's working a plan here, and this is how God works with us. Now, go to chapter 17 of the book of Genesis. Chapter 17 of the book of Genesis. What I want you to do is begin to, gra to grasp the fact that our God is a covenant-making God. God makes covenants with us, and we make covenant with God. And then, then be aware of this, we make covenants with one another. You're going to see that in just a moment. But God, working with Abram at that point, because his name had not yet been changed, and it will be changed. We'll not go into all of that detail at this time. But notice what he says in chapter 17, book of Genesis Picking up at verse 3, Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my, hey, there's that word, covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, exalted father. Your name will be Abraham, father of many nations. And I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. Look at this now. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. You must keep my covenant. You say, now, 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 Edwin, that sounds a whole lot like a contract. No. Keeping the covenant means receiving the covenant and responding to what the covenant is all about. There is a difference there in regard to that. Because whether Abram had received it or not, the covenant was going on. The covenant was happening, and Abram was the beneficiary at that time. The sign of that covenant becomes circumcision. It is an everlasting covenant. If you skip down to verse 13, my covenant, the last sentence in verse 13, my covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant covenant. This, this is so thrilling to me. I, I love to look at the Word of God and begin to see what God is doing with them and what God is wanting to do with us. There's another aspect of covenant, and that is when covenants are made with people. Jonathan and David were, had covenants. Now, it is initiated for the benefit of the other person. What God did, he did for Abraham. What God did with Noah, he did for Noah. What God does with us, he does for us. Jonathan became a bosom friend to David. If you go to the book of 1 Samuel, how are your skates working? Working pretty well? 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. I want you to look there at verses 2 through 4. Let's just go ahead and, and, and pick up at verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul... Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. Get ready. Verse 3, And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Remarkable. Here is a representation of the covenant. Do you remember the, the, the symbol that God gave to Noah? The rainbow. And we get the benefit of that even in our own lives because it was an eternal covenant. And now Jonathan's making a covenant with David. Well, now that goes on and there's so much more that we could say about that. Time does not permit me to say it. 
Have you ever heard the term BFF? BFF, they are BFF. You see two people and someone says, they are BFF. What is BFF? Best friends forever. Well, do you know what? That's Jonathan David. The covenant was made and they became best friends. There's so much that we could share with you about that. We have not time to do that in this particular study. Then God and the Hebrew people. Notice that. That is also a covenant. God also makes a covenant, not just with individuals, but with groups of people. He can do that. He's, he's made a covenant with me individually, but also with me as a part of the redeemed of the ages. My, oh my, what an amazing thought that is. Joshua 24, and you can, can jot down maybe these on the note paper that you have there. Jot down those scripture references and search those out, and you'll see how God worked with the children of Israel as a covenant-making God. And that had come from Abraham all through the generations of the nation of Israel. Now, let's look to this next thing. Unconditional promises. The Hebrew people receive some unconditional promises. Now, if you go back to the book of Exodus, go back to the book of Exodus with me. That's the second book in the Old Testament. Go back to the book of Exodus, and I want you to see there chapter 19. Chapter 19. And I didn't write this one on here. I don't have that on the slide for you. So you might want to just jot down Exodus or put EX period for an abbreviation, 19 verses 5 and 6. This is where I need to differentiate, again, between contracts and covenants. Uh, notice what he says in verse 5, what the Word says. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. This is what God told Moses to tell the children of Israel. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. That's what God told Moses to tell the Israelites. And you see, so God has made that, that commitment to the Hebrew people, and it is a covenant that has become very, very real, and God extends that. I, 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 there are so many things that we could say about that. We say, well, well, Edwin, that sounds a lot like a contract. Yes, but... There is a difference in that contract idea and the covenant idea. Again, it comes back to receiving the covenant. We receive the covenant. It is not based ultimately on us. God gives us the covenant. Do you remember Queen Esther? Do you remember Queen Esther when she was was queen, and when Mordecai came to her and he said to her, who knows but that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. But if you do not do what you need to do at this time, God will carry out his plan, but he'll do it through another. Now that's my paraphrase of, of his conversations with his cousin Esther, Esther and Mordecai. And, and when, when I think about that, I think that's it. That's, that's that thing of God's going to carry out his covenant. He's going to carry out his promise. He's going to carry out his redemptive plan. I want to be a part of that. Do you remember the Apostle Paul saying, my greatest fear is that I'll be a castaway, that God will go ahead and do all his work and he'll leave me out. I don't want to be left out of the work of God. Now let me go to this next thing based on steadfast love. The covenant that God makes is based on His steadfast love. There are two words, hesed in the Hebrew in, and then agape in the Greek. This is God's loving kindness, hesed. 
God's loving kindness. That is that covenant love. That is the steadfast love of God. Agatha, you already know that. Many of you are aware that that is the unconditional love of God. And the verses that I've chosen to look at with you, let's try to see if we can find this. Are your fingers doing okay? Go to the book of Lamentations. You say, where in the world is Lamentations? Well, if you go to the Psalms and then turn right, go toward Isaiah. When you get to Isaiah, that's a big book. Then you go to Jeremiah. When you get past Jeremiah, you come to that little book called Lamentations, Lamentations. And in Lamentations, in chapter 3, have you made it to Lamentations? You say, oh, I can't find it, I can't find it. Look it up in the index. Lamentations, chapter 3. I want you to see this very clearly. Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. God's great love, His loving kindness, we are not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is God's faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for Him. Now, that's that hesed. That's that steadfast love of God. That is the loving kindness of God. That is the steadfast love of God that draws us to Himself. Steadfast love is a focus. It is a choice. It is an attitude. It is an action. Now, did you get that? It is a focus. It is a choice. It is an attitude. It is an action. You may want to write that down because that's what we're talking about when we talk about covenant marriage. A focus, a choice, an attitude, an action, that steadfast love. That is what God has shown us in His covenant, in His covenant-making promises that God has made. Now, you already know what I'm pointing to in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know that chapter so well. You may or may not want to, to run this one with us. But 1 Corinthians 13, I want you to see this unconquerable benevolence of God. This unconditional love. Love is patient. Love is kind. This is in verse 4. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. And on and on he goes and he talks about the powerful, steadfast love, the agape of God, the hesed of God. We read of it in Lamentations where it's loving kindness in the Hebrew. Now we read of that love, that agape love of God in 1 Corinthians 13. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Now, did you get those words? You say, oh, I wish you'd say those words again about steadfast love. Steadfast love is a focus. It is a choice. It is an attitude. It is an action. Now, we need to go a little bit further, and I'm watching our time. Number four, covenant relationships view commitments as being permanent. God and Noah, Genesis 9, 12 through 16. We've already looked at that, haven't we? We know what that's about. God made that commitment to Noah. He got him in the ark, and after he got through with the flood, he got him out of the ark, and he said, Now there's the rainbow. That's the sign of my covenant with you that I will never, ever again destroy the earth by water. I'm absolutely sure he'll never do that again, aren't you? Because he made a covenant. He made a covenant. Ruth and Naomi. Uh, do you remember Ruth and Naomi? In, in Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, uh, she, Ruth says to Naomi, Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God will be my God. In other words, we're going to be together. I make this covenant with you. I am staying with you. Do you see that focus there? <laughs> Do you see that choice? Do you see that attitude? Do you see that action that she took at that time? Now, believing followers of Jesus Christ, this passage tells us in John 10 
that we cannot be plucked out of the hand of God. Amazing, amazing, astounding words. So that is a covenant that God makes with us when we respond and receive His covenant promise of redemption. When we receive Jesus into our lives, there is nothing that can take us away from God. Absolutely nothing. John 10, 27 through 29. And then we come to number five. Covenants require confrontation and forgiveness. Do you know that that's true with God and His children throughout Scripture? Uh, you know, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. God is saying there is a need for you in the midst of this covenant relationship we have for you to be obedient to the things I've shared with you. It's not an if then. Here's the covenant. And if you receive it, if you receive it, you can count on my forgiveness. But God does confront us, and we have to confront one another. Uh, Psalm 89 is an amazing, amazing passage dealing with some of this and dealing with confrontation. We'll have not time to go into that. And then 1 John 1, 8 and 9. Now, we've gone through that with our roller skates on. And here's the question. Is covenant marriage truly possible in our times? Is it possible for us to make a covenant with someone that is based on steadfast love? It is, is it possible for us to get that kind of a focus, that kind of a choice, that kind of an attitude, that kind of an action, and I am giving you the answer, yes, absolutely yes. You say, Edwin, how do we do it? I'm glad you ask. Start with you and God. Start with you and start with God. Start with you and God. Go to God and say, I want a covenant marriage. I want that to be. Move on the heart of the spouse that I already have or on the spouse that I will have. I want so much for my marriage to be a covenant marriage, not a contract that can be destroyed, that can be dissolved by the state. I want a covenant marriage that stands throughout my life. Second thing, extend to the person he places or has placed in your life. Extend to them. Talk with God about it. Say, God, you're a covenant-making God. You've made covenant with me. You've made covenant with all believers in you. I want to make a covenant with my spouse. I want to make a covenant with my spouse that I have or my spouse that is to be. The third thing, enact the covenant in the grace of God. Say, I commit to you in steadfast love. Go back and look at that scripture with Jonathan. Jonathan gave a representation of that. Do you know? Here it is. I, that, that ring represents so much to me. That's the ring that Joanne Evans, now Jenkins, gave to me 50 years ago. That is a symbol of our covenant marriage together. It is a covenant. It is not going to be broken. It will not be broken. And I am so grateful. I cherish that more every single day of my life. I've lost just about everything else that I've had, but I haven't lost that ring. Now, it's okay if you lose your ring, but this is a symbol for me. This is a symbol, and it is so special in my life. Final thing, live the life. Do it. Do it. Live a covenant marriage. Live in a covenant life. Live the way of the covenant. Rekindle the fires of faith. You can have a covenant marriage. You can have a marriage that honors God and honors your spouse. Oh, it is not only possible, it is prescribed by the Word of God. Possible and prescribed. So let's have covenant marriages. I look forward to seeing you next week. We're going to continue in the book of Malachi. Let me pray for you before we go. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the time we've had together this evening or today, whenever someone is viewing this. And Lord, I pray that the lessons of this day would be meaningful for them 
even as they've been meaningful for me as you've taught them to me. In Jesus' name, amen.